Right, today we are going to be making a prawn pot or slash lobster pot. I mean, it caught lobsters better than it caught a prawn. And we're going to be talking about lobsters. Now, before we start, if any of you watch my older vids, and I mean some of the older ones, older, older ones, you may find those ads turning up in the middle of the videos. Now, I had nothing to do with that. I Somebody said ages ago that I was putting too many ads in my videos, and I thought, well, that's odd, because I only ever put possibly one at the beginning, maybe one at the end. I never put them in the middle of the video, because I just don't want the videos being disrupted by ads. Anyway, I checked the video out that they said, and sure enough, there was ads turned on in the middle of the video. So I went through, turned it off, had a look through the other videos, and found a couple more, there's only a couple more, that were the same. So I turned the ads off in those as well, left it at that. A few days ago, I went back and checked the videos. This is after months, this happened months ago. Checked the videos to find that nearly 300 videos have all had the ads switched on in the middle of the video. Now, I had nothing to do with that, so it's obviously something YouTube's done. Um, my recent videos won't have the ads. You know, I think about 30 or 40 didn't, and about 350 have all had it switched on. So I'm having to go through all those videos at the moment and turn off all the ads. I mean, I could just leave it, but I really don't want the ads playing in, in the middle of the videos. Maybe the oldest oldest ones, I might just leave them. But um, so far, I've got through about 100 videos, and I've got the ads back off of those. So if you do get any adverts in the middle of any of the older videos you might watch, my apologies for disturbing your video. <laughs> like I say, it was not me. Um, and I will get through them, and I will turn them off. I just hope this doesn't happen again, because like I say, it's possibly when they've updated something, and it's defaulted something to turning ads on, I don't know. But it is a big annoyance. In fact, I was flipping cheesed off. Especially I'm now having to sit through, probably going to take me an hour or two just to go through all those videos to switch them off, because it's not just a simple case of flicking a switch and they all go off. You've got to do them one by one, so, yeah. Anyway, enough of that. Let's get back to today's video, and let's get this pot made. Right, well, I'm in the middle of making one of the prawn pots. I wasn't really going to bother filming it, but I thought, why not? I might put it together as something else. We'll see when the time comes. So what I'm doing is I'm recycling the... Well, they've been recycled. These are off of old pots. In fact, they, they're off of very old pots, because... And then I'll show you one. Let me see that one there. Look at how many screws have been put into this one. Now, sometimes I put in an extra screw each year. Normally, on the ends... Not so much on these bars in the middle, which means these bars have been replaced or I've or I've reused this pipe over several pots. So this this bar is probably off of pots going back oh, I don't know years. So it just shows you can re keep reusing bits. I won't use this one because it's got a lot of bits sticking out of it. Um, one thing I thought was when I put this net on this is for the prawns. These little bits of metal sticking out are a bit of a pain. That's why I'm going over these ones and clearing up any parts that stick out like that. So it just doesn't hook on the net when I'm trying to put the net over. And uh, it's just a case of either whacking them out or some of you can unscrew them still a little bit. That one probably can actually. Yeah, the head's gone. Oh, hold on. Never mind, I'll get it out using some snips probably. Do it. So yeah, so I'm gonna need five bars. These are <coughs> these are actually gonna be an inch shorter than the other bars, that's just because they're cut shorter, so I just picked the shortest one and so they'll be like that. Now I've made the base already. There's the base, so it's like a picture frame really. So these are two by ones. This one is 18 inches by 30 inches. It's the same size as the other prawn pot that we made. Like I said, the only difference is on this one, the bars will be slightly short, slightly shorter. This is actually a new one. I'm gonna to need to make one more because I need an extra bar. But it'll look something like this is surprising actually, you take an inch off, it does drop it quite a bit. Now I don't want it too low, I said I was going to make a lower one, this will be the lower one. I don't want it too low because I don't want the neck too close to the bottom because obviously 
lobsters and things can sort of stick their feet up, grab hold of it and probably find their way back out. So you want a little bit of height just to keep it, keep them from reaching up to it. So it'll be something like that. Right, I'd better get on and put these bits together. Now I've seen I've seen a few people make pots like this, and you can do them different ways. It's up to you. But I see some people actually drill holes into the wood and put the pipe into the wood. You can do it that way if you want to do it that way, but I always go on the outside for the simple reason: if you if you drill through the wood here, the size of the pipe, especially if you use the next size up, you've got very little wood either side and basically if your pot gets knocked around in a storm you can crack, you can break your wood very easily and the other thing is, is this wood gets eaten away by shipworm over a few years and if you've only got a centimetre of wood either side of your plastic, that's all you've got and the shipworm will eat away and your pot will just get destroyed. They won't last very long so, I mean not last. Uh, when they're drilled, I mean, they'll last probably, I would have thought, a season. Unless, like I say, they get bashed on a rock or something. But you are... You are weakening your pot quite a lot by going through the wood. That's why I always... Lost the side. Now, you may think, oh, but the screws will rust out. They don't. They will over time. I mean, depending on what screws you use, I tend to go with four mils. Yeah, you can go up to five. You just got to be a bit careful. You don't split your wood in places if you're using a five. Threes, you can use three. Again, they're a little bit thin. But every year when they come out of the water or you're not using them again, you can always go over them before the next season and just bang in an extra screw each year. And that's all you need. You don't need to put, replace them all. Just the odd one screw through or any weak points you may think. You can always bang an extra screw in. But they tend to last. Suggestions have been made about using stainless screws. Now I did actually put a couple of stainless on the inside here, but the only reason I've done that is this is a prawn pot and it, because of the net it makes it very difficult for me to get inside with the small necks and stuff. If I was to put an extra screw in, I can do it from underneath, but to do a repair. So I thought I'd just try the stainless, but to be honest, stainless, there's no point in making the pot if the screws are going to outlive the pot by a long way kind of thing for, for the cost as well. What did used to last quite a long time, when, we, when I first started doing them, I used to use galvanised nails. Um, they're a pain in the ass to put in because obviously you've got to hammer them and you're bashing away at your joints and stuff. But they don't rot that quick, so galvanised nails last a long time. You can always use that if that's all you've got. And you can still make these with those. You don't need to use screws. I just use screws for the, for the, because it's easier. On top of that, when I dismantle the pots, if you've got nails in, they're a real pig to get apart again. Whereas screws, you can just snap them, or you can um, quite often you can unscrew them still. Uh, oh, four screws. What I'm actually going to do with this is on the end grain, what I tend to do is put a much longer screw in so it runs down there because these ends on the pot they are what you'd class as the weak points because they're taking most of the they're taking most of the sort of damage and stuff when they're getting hooked on rocks, they can get hooked on things, they can get whacked, they can do, they take a lot of beating. So it's always better to put a, a nice long screw down the end grain. Plus a short screw won't hold in the end grain very well. Um, if I can find some longish screws. Just get the number there. I'm just gonna put the neck in the right place. Yeah, the other thing with these, um, 
pots is you like I was saying about drilling holes and weakening your pot. When it's on the side like this anyway, what you find is once you've roped it up, once you've put the net on, the actual pot, the pot is held together with not just the screws, but with the ropes and with the net and all that. If you, if these screws rot out on these pots, they don't just fall apart. Everything's still held together and they still maintain their shape. That's why I said before, you can pretty much lose most of the bars the screws in all of this but the whole thing is still held together because of the roping and the netting so even when you get a busted up pot it still maintains its shape and it still catches that's the beauty of them and that's why you can pretty much use these pots until they until they um, completely fall apart the thing is if you drill the hole through the base and you weaken that part if you get a break in the main part of your pot then your pot will start to literally come apart you know it'll fold up and that because of those breaks so that is why you're better off screwing to the side and maintaining the strength of the pot even if drilling holes and sticking the pipe in you think it looks good it's not good for its strength Trust me, we made a pot like that once. Now another interesting thing is, when you see pots that get made, and you get really, really big pots, and you get small pots, and people kind of ask, are the big pots, do they catch more because they're a bigger pot? And it's kind of weird because I've always found that it doesn't matter if it's big or small. Um, I mean, if it's, I say it doesn't matter. If you were going to fish for spider crab, then a big pot is good if you can lift it. You've got to remember, if that pot fills right up, and I have seen a pot like that, an old box pot, and it was filled right to the top of the net with spider crab. You could not get any more in it. I think it was something like 44 spider crabs were in that. Couldn't lift it out of the water. We had to literally lean over the side and empty the crabs out of the neck to be able to get the pot over. It was that heavy. So, yes, spider crabs, you can fill a pot up if you've got a big pot. If you're using for lobster, then over here anyway, or in UK waters, it probably won't make much difference. Um, I've had big pots that have caught plenty of lobsters, and I've had small pots that have caught plenty of lobsters. The thing is, quite often, you tend to only get so many lobsters in a pot, because when you get more than two or three, they sort of start fight. well, they fight. So even if you do get a few in the pot, quite often you'll take them out and they'll have missing limbs, they won't have any claws, or they'll be dead, because they fight. So having more lobsters in the pot doesn't always work like that. You know, or it isn't beneficial necessarily. I'd rather catch, say, two lobsters in a pot and catch another two the next day than catch four, and two of them have lost their claws or possibly dead, and the next day not catch a lobster, because there's only so many lobsters in certain areas before there isn't and then you have to wait for them to resource supply as they move around kind of thing and yes lobsters move around you may think that they always stay in holes they do stay in holes but in my experience it's not a permanent thing you'll get them in holes and they'll move around they might stay in the hole for a week two weeks a month two months but they inevitably move around otherwise if they just stayed in the same place you'd have to ask yourself why do you go out every year and how do you find lobsters in the same place if you caught all the lobsters there last year so yes they do move around and I think usually I think in autumn you'll find big females will travel around probably looking for a mate or something but the big females do move around a lot and that's why we tend to see a lot of fe larger females in autumn as they're travelling. Right, one more. But yeah, as I was saying, um, size of the pot, I wouldn't worry about it too much. As long as it's big enough to get a couple of lobsters in. You know, I mean, our prawn pot is one of our smallest pots that we're using, and that pot has, well, you saw what it caught if you watched the videos. 
you saw how well that caught. It was getting a, a lobster a trip, and it was getting sometimes two lobsters and quite large ones for, for what it was. And my smallest pot I've ever made, which was, I might have showed you, it's only about that, about, yeah, smaller than this pot, it's like that. It's just a little square one, same idea as this, and it had no traps in it, nothing like that, just a straightforward pot it was. And within the first few drops of that one, I had a six and a half pound lobster go in that one. So, and that was in my smallest pot, so. And that is one of my biggest lobsters. Not the biggest. <coughs> I think my biggest lobster, well I estimated it was probably around nine pounds. Why do I say it was around nine pounds? I never actually was able to weigh it. Um, I say it was nine pounds because I actually had a three pound lobster on the boat and the three pound lobster was as big as the claw of the one I say is about nine pound. It could have been even bigger. but. The three pound lobster was almost as big as the claw, so if you take two claws and a body, I just looked at it and said two claws and a body, body probably around nine pound. But like I say, we'll never know. Because I never took it to measure it, so. So yeah, when you get a lobster, like I say, that's, well, seven, eight pound bigger, upwards, I'd say eight pound upwards. Uh, that's a big lobster. When you get a lobster that's below that, or anything even up to five, six pound, they're not that big. They look big, because like I say, you don't see many. But in terms of the life cycle of a lobster, what you've got to remember is the lobsters that you're getting on your plates, they're babies. That's pretty much the gist of it. They are babies. They're not old. But unfortunately, Restaurants mainly dictate the size of the lobster because they only want to put the smallest size sort of lobster they can on a plate for maximum profit. If they're putting up half a five pound lobster on your plate, they're either going to charge you an absolute fortune which you're not going to pay, or they're going to lose money because they can't charge what they need to charge for. And that's why quite often lobster restaurants don't want to buy big lobsters they always want the small ones and they that's that's actually fact i know when i've sold to hotels in the past and i get the bigger lobsters i can't sell them they don't want them they always want the small ones they'll take a big one now and again if they've got like a, a buffet where they want a center display or something but in general Not only that, when you get lobsters that smaller, you're more likely to get more chance of getting ones where the meat isn't as good because because they're changing their shells so often, they have to remake the meat inside. And once they change their shell, they tend to get a bit wishy-washy. Quite often, shore lobsters, ones from the beaches, um, when you find them, they'll be a little bit like that. They'll, they'll have meat in them, but they're not as packed as they could be because they, quite often they go on the in the shallows, in the holes, around the rocks, obviously, to change their shells. So sometimes when you find them, they haven't changed their shell that long. They'll still be in there for quite a while. They'll still, while their shell's hardening, they'll stay hidden in the hole. And that's why when the tide quite often goes out, a lot of lobsters will leave holes when the tide goes out, won't dry out, sort of thing. But some won't, and they stay in the holes. They'll stay in the hole if there's water, is one reason. But the other reason that they stay in the hole is because their shells aren't that hard yet. So they stay in the holes because um, they don't want to go out in the open amongst predators when their shell's not hard. And that's why, quite often, some of those lobsters from the beaches aren't great. And that's why you've got to know what you're doing when you, when you find them, that you're not taking, taking ones that have just changed their shell. Because you'll, you'll feel it when you pick them up. There'll be a slight sponginess to the shell. And when you open them, you'll just have a lot of water and a lot of space between the meat and the, sh in the shell. Personally, it's just not, no point killing something like that. You're better off letting him get his shell. I've had them in the pots before. They've gone in the pots and you feel them and you feel, oh, that's... They're not soft, but you can feel they're springy. Chuck them back. It's a waste of time taking them. All you end up doing is giving somebody a lobster, and when they open it, half the meat's missing and it's full of water. And that doesn't do you any good 
if they get lobsters like that, doesn't do you any good, and doesn't do them any good. You may think, oh, well, you sold a lobster, but you've also made somebody get not what they thought they were getting. They bought water from you, not meat. Now, when you're fishing for lobsters and crabs, as a general rule, in our waters anyway, um, lobsters, you want to use older bait, maybe a day old, two day old. You can use a really rotten, you can use it a week old if you like. But generally, older bait. And crab, generally fresh bait. Although you will catch both on both. You can usually lessen or increase your chances with lobster by having old bait because the crabs won't go into the pot so much. So it leaves a freer pot for the lobster to go in. But, if you're just out there to put a pot out to catch anything and everything, fresh bait. Because lobsters will still go in for fresh bait, it's just that crabs have a habit of moving a lot faster and getting in the pots first. But that doesn't mean to say you won't catch, because you will. So, there we have it. Hope you can see that alright. Um, I've got to put the sidebars on, I'll do that in a minute but starting to take shape. As you can see when the net goes in. See the wide old one, there we go. It's because they bend around, that's why. Here we go, you get the idea. So, I've um, ripped down some wood. Basically this is some old wood that's been kicking around for quite a while, it's still okay. These will go on like, like that. They're on the outside of the net, that's why the net's going on, because it's obviously a prawn net, so I need to protect the net. They'll act as like bumpers more than anything, those. And then, being they're quite heavy, those two pieces, I thin these two down, and these are just to go up to support the, the neck. That'll go into the pot. Also, they will act as bumpers, but they're not so important on there, that's why they're smaller. So the thing is, I'm going to put this net around once, then I'm going to put a layer of crab pot net over the top. Now whether I actually put the net on top of this net and then put those on, or whether I go straight over the bars, I'll think about that as I make it. And I'll see what works out best. So all I've done is literally just um, tack it on with some horseshoe and else one end, and just roll it round. Now I need it fairly tight because it's going to go, obviously there's no support between the, the pipes at the moment and it can cause the net to sag for a little bit, so a bit tighter is probably a little bit better. But not so tight. The net should never be that tight because if it's really, really tensioned and it bangs a rock, it can break very easily if it, you know, that just that pure tension on it. So you want a little bit of give, so when it bounces something, it pushes the net in a little bit. Not saggy, but you know firm you might say right hopefully I've got enough net to get around I do I don't know why oh that's that end of the net just try to do it so I don't waste net which isn't easy when you're using an old sane net for sand deal let's make sure I've still got a couple of little bits of metal sticking out which are hooking it's probably the plastic actually where the plastic's in Drilled into there we go, that should do. I do believe prawns come in. I mean there's always some around, but they come in and go out. I mean some years, like I say, you'll go down the beach to see them everywhere. Great big prawns. Other years you won't see any. Or near enough any. Anything decent anyway. There's a difference. You always get little prawns everywhere. Little tiny ones, but it's the big ones you want. And they tend to move. They're probably migrating, spawning, that kind of thing. Right, I'm gonna cut that. I'm thinking about should I put some weights in it now because it's a pain in the ass to get in and get weights done when you go too far with these sort of because the net's so small I can almost strap in a couple of weights like that yeah I think I will but I'll do that off camera because it takes a while to, to strap the weights in especially when you're dealing with fine net like this 
because I'll have to put the strings around at least that side around the pipes and the wood so you know what I forgot to do with this so I've just realised now when I'm sort of doing the bars at the side I didn't put the uh, end pieces in <laughs> fortunately that's not tied down that's only tacked just to keep it taut while I was working on it um, so I can still get in there and make these end bits which go like that they just snap into place and they screw from the outside so we'll be right with that it's just it shows too much talk. <laughs> right, just gonna go and notch them. Right, so we've got the weights in, the outer skin on. This I leave open for the moment. Now I'm gonna put the outer net on. Yeah, so basically just lay this over the top and I will join it together and then I'll put the bars on and adjust the tension and that on it it's probably the best way to do it because like I said I've got to just pull these bars out just a little bit right, let me start from the bottom I always start from the from around here or well, actually we'll start from further over what I'm going to do is I'm going to double the base I think because the base is always the thing you've got to think of for obvious reasons when it lands on rocks and things but what I'm thinking is if I put if I double net it on the base because I do it on the crab pots with this net anyway double it on the base and basically I go around start here you go around and then you bring it back and you finish off here that way you end up doubling the base now like I say this is just like a shield really for this pot but in effect like I say if the net finally breaks, gets holes in it, then it will turn into a lobster pot, so it'll save me having to do repairs on it. But like I say, once it's broken, I know it's broken, I'll just give up on it and make it into a regular pot. Because this is all like for fun and experiments and stuff. I mean, I don't seriously expect to have a pot which will get me lots of prawns. Not over here. If you, not where I am, if you live somewhere else or in the right place, then you could get use it as a regular prawn pot but I'm not in no sort of area or well, I'm on the wrong side of the island just about to start up this Honda engine out here I haven't started up for well since it came out of the water basically and I just I, I haven't been able to get it off the engine the boat because of my back but it's, uh, I gave somebody a call to give me a hand to I'm just gonna see if it starts like I say after for several months hopefully everything works all right I'm gonna strip it down and ch check out all the impeller and everything and basically gonna winter it and keep it uh, keep it in the shed for now because I might like I say switch out to this one if things don't work out with the other one we'll see just gonna let some water in the barrel first right so will it start or won't it It's going to be a bit awkward because I've got a shed behind me. Always choke out on these ones. It's a little bit stiff. I need some oil. Oh, like I said, a bit awkward with the shed behind me. There we go. Not bad. Needed the fuel to get through. about to do it in this bucket. Yeah, no, she's running beautifully. Right, well, there we go. Engine's back inside. So, we've been flushed and checked. Like I say, started with the first, was it four pulls? It was pretty much straight away, really, because, I mean, the fuel had to get through it, first of all, anyway. But, water was pumping out of it fine so it's good to get back in the shed I will work on it at a later date but everything looks 
Everything's looking good. So it should do. I mean, that one is. I can't remember when we got that one. It's on the video, isn't it? Two. Was it 2017 or was it 2018? 217, I think, for that one. And then we've got the 20 horse, which is 2018. They're about the same age, these two engines. Although the difference is, is this one I've been using. That one's done only a few hours. I don't know if it was 20 hours or 40 hours or something like that. But I can tell you now, that engine over there has barely done any hours at all. Right, let's get back to doing this pot. Got the first bar on. I was just looking at this because I'm going to snap this over the, the edging. I wonder if I could do all of it actually. That would be quite cool. Because then we could protect the ends. It's all about trial and error though. Like We know the other design worked really well. Not for the prawn, but for lobster at the time. So this is just a, a few different twists to the same sort of pot. Although ultimately, like I say, we will be chasing after prawns, but I've actually got another idea for for the prawns. I'm going to, um, I might make some very small, like small ones, like little ones, like two, two, three of them maybe, just little ones that are very low to the ground and separated pots that lobsters cannot get in. It'll just be very small necks. But um, we'll see how we get on with time and that, because obviously I've got to get all this done, and I've also got. A lot of boat stuff to do. So we'll see how the time goes. And if it's possible. There, I think it was, you know. I think we used a small pipe last time. But that works as well, that snaps on, a little grip there, and they don't come off because like I said they have been tested before so so yeah but it doesn't really matter I can use the big ones or the small ones I just do it like I say on the ends because those are the parts that are going to whack rocks when you pull the pot up or if it moves it'll bang onto these parts same along the bottom here what I'll do is I'll get a piece of pipe the smaller one probably and literally screw it down along there and that's like a bumper because obviously when your boat's drifting along and you're pulling a pot up, this bashes into things, so it's just to save your netting really, it's like a bumper. And that's what all these do as well, if it moves or goes down between rocks. And hopefully, that'll be another design, ready to go. We'll see. Okay, yeah. So I'm just deciding on what to do next. I was going to do another, another one just with the net but I might just stay with the net one we got because my only concern is just having it as net that net is going to take such a pasting I know the other one survived and did all right and all the rest of it but you know all it takes is one storm in the wrong place and this net will get shredded whereas at least with it's got this sort of stuff on it it'll protect it a bit like I say I might make some little ones I'm, I'm thinking about it some little mini ones like half the size of these and half maybe half as low make some small ones, little tiny necks like say that big going in and maybe several of them in different angles purely for full on prawn kind of style and small enough to actually be able to carry around anywhere you could even take them off the shore I'll think about it but like I say this just needs a bit of tying up there plastic bumpers put on bang the neck in, stick in a hole to get stuff in and out. I think what the best way to do that is, yeah, probably just cut it, line it and just have a string. And make the bait bag thing near the near the neck so it'll be there the bait bag. And it'll be very similar to our other one, or almost the same. Just the fact that it's got green netting on it, just acting as a protector for the white net. And of course we've got all these to try this year. So we'll have several different types anyway, we'll soon find out what works, what doesn't work, which is the best catcher, which is the worst catcher, do they survive taking a pasting out there in 10 metre tides and 7 knot tides or whatever it is, we have, we have crazy speed tides out there. And uh, yeah, see what interesting things we can catch.
like I say, last year we didn't really give them a long enough test and it kind of came to an end very quickly because of the weather turns and obviously my back went wrong and I didn't have a lot of enthusiasm to, to go out. So. Plus we'd better pull all these up with our new winch. <laughs>